Hello, thanks for joining us. My name is John Klatt. Every day, tens of thousands of people are injured, even killed, in accidents at home, work, and at play. And emergency services may be minutes, even hours away. The first aid care that you provide can mean the difference between life and death. In this video, we're going to show you how to provide care for those that are injured and sick. And we're going to give you some tips to help keep you safe during these rescues. This is emergency first aid when seconds count. Okay, in this situation we have what's called a blast injury. Now you can see behind me there's an oxygen bottle, a kerosene bottle, an acetylene bottle, even a propane bottle. A blast is a blast. When these things explode, shrapnel or pieces of metal can go everywhere. You can have a whole variety of injuries. You can see here that we have two victims from a blast or an explosion that just happened behind me. So now I'm going to do something called triage. Penman is, the scene is safe, I have my personal protective equipment, we're well away from the bottles there, we're not going to get hurt. I come up to my first victim, which is Jacob here. So Jacob, Jacob, are you okay? Yes. So Jacob is conscious, I don't see any bleeding on him, but he is breathing. He's laying down, he is conscious. Let me go over and check Danielle. So when I come over and Danielle, I see that she's injured as well. We see a big evisceration here, some organs are out of her body here, as well as she's bleeding here. Now, controlling bleeding is the most important part of this first aid right now, because somebody can bleed to death in as little as two minutes. If Jacob quit breathing, he's got about six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes before we need to start doing rescue breaths with him. So we're going to come over and we're going to control bleeding because that is our primary concern. So the ways of controlling bleeding can be direct pressure, elevation, and pressure points. That's the way to start. So the initial method in controlling bleeding is just to put gauze pad over this and wrap it up. Now the different levels of bleeding is capillary bleeding where Danielle might have a large scrape, venous bleeding where there's been a deep puncture and dark blood is coming out, or this you can see is arterial bleeding. And arterial bleeding is where every time her heart beats, it's pumping blood and that is the most life threatening. So we're going to take care of that right away. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and start putting some 4x4s or gauze pad on her leg. Never remove any gauze pad that you have on there because if you remove any gauze pad, you might tear off the, the um, scabbing that's on there. So once you put gauze pad on there, keep it on there, never remove it. If I can control bleeding with just this, roll, this gauze, then I'm going to go ahead and secure it with some roller gauze. So I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get, I'm just going to lift up your leg a little bit here. I'm going to control bleeding. So Danielle, it's likely that she can go unconscious or have an altered level of consciousness because of this bleeding here. So I'm going to get it as tight as possible. I can also do what's called a pressure bandage, is that when I start rolling this roller gauze, once I twist it, I'll put high pressure or more pressure on this bleed here. And I can continue to do that. Every time I wrap it around, I come over with my gauze pad, twist it around, that puts more pressure, and then tuck it. And again, if she needs some more controlling of bleeding, then I can add some more gauze pad. Now that's direct pressure. Pressure points is another thing. She has a large vessel or artery that runs along her leg called the femoral artery. If I can't control bleeding with direct pressure and I can't really elevate her leg, I can use the heel of my hand and press in. We have a femoral artery right here and what it does is it runs along the inside of your leg. If you take your thumb and then slide your finger over into the side here, this groove is where this femoral artery is. What I could do is use the heel of my hand, put pressure on Danielle's femoral artery, putting pressure against her iliac crest here, or her hip bone, and I can put pressure on there, and that may control bleeding. The problem with this method of controlling bleeding is, is that if I put pressure on this, I have to keep my hand on there, and I can't go help Jake. So if I had somebody else, say in a triage situation where somebody was walking around, they got hurt from the blast, I might be able to utilize them, tell them to come over and help you, instruct them on what to do, and they can put pressure. 
Now the last effort in controlling bleeding is something called tourniquets. Now again, state and local laws may not allow you to use tourniquets, so make sure you know that it's appropriate to use a tourniquet before you use it. Okay, in this scenario, Patrick was using this grinder over here and he lost a finger. So I'm working in this shop and I look over and I notice that somebody has, uh, has gotten hurt. I come on over to Patrick's aid. Now, I may not have PPE on right away. I might have to go to a first aid kit. In that situation, let's say that you looked over and you saw your coworker lose a finger or get injured. It looks like that he's holding on to his own hand here and this finger is over here. We're going to let him do that while you go ahead and get your PP on because you're not necessarily going to bring that with you. So, uh, hey Patrick, what happened? Oh, I got the machine, cut it off. Okay, so he looks like he's in a lot of pain. You know, I can address Patrick before I place my PP on and note that if he's starting to go into shock, I might have him sitting down. Um, he might be more comfortable sitting down or I could lay him all the way down in the shock position. But he seems to be fine at this time. He is in a lot of pain. I'm going to keep an eye on him. Run over, get my personal protective equipment on. I've got my gloves on, and now I'm going to come back and address this. So what do we do first? We're going to take care of Patrick before we take care of this, uh, this missing finger right now. Um, a lot of times when people lose fingers and feet and hands and pieces of skin and stuff like that, we don't see a lot of bleeding. And the reason we don't see a lot of bleeding is when something is um, yanked off or pulled off, the blood vessels will pull and then when they snap back, because they're elastic, they'll close off and we won't see a lot of bleeding going on. So sometimes people are missing fingers and toes and, and hands and feet and stuff and they're not bleeding a lot from that, uh, from that area. So, but we are going to address Patrick first. I'm taking note that he's starting to go into shock he might start breathing fast, he might get uh, pale, diaphoretic sweating because when you go into shock, all your vessels dilate, the blood comes to the surface, and you start sweating. Putting him in the shock position would do this. We could lay him down in the shock position, elevate his feet. The reason we're doing that is because when he goes into shock, his blood vessels dilate, he's losing a lot of blood from his brain, so we elevate his feet 12, 14, 16 inches with anything, um, a, a pail, uh, a board, a box, or something like that, keep his feet elevated. That's called the, um, the shock position. But he looks like he's doing okay. So I'm going to provide some first aid for Patrick. And I went over to the first aid kit, and I got some 4 by 4s This is the first way you are going to use to control bleeding, is our 4 by 4s or any type of absorbent towels here. So, okay, Patrick, I got it, buddy. So you can go ahead and pull this away so I can go ahead and take a look at that. Now, if he's comfortable with his fingers wrapped tight, he is missing one finger here, I can go ahead and wrap up his entire hand, what's left of it, and you can put two or three on here depending on how much you need to control bleeding. Now, in this case, when I put my roller gauze on, I'm not going to be able to overlap it 50% like um, in the other cases here. So I'm just going to go ahead and move this around the hand here and make sure that I keep this 4x4 four four or gauze on his hand. Again, the roller gauze, all it's really doing here is keeping your absorbent 4x4 four four on there and controlling bleeding. You can always put more pressure on there if you're having difficulty um, controlling bleeding. So I'm going to roll this around and then I'm going to end up tucking it in one of these, uh, in one of these loose pieces here. So if that controls bleeding, we're good to go for Patrick here. And we can start treating him for shock and taking care of his finger. If I can't control bleeding with just this bandage here, I can add some more bandages. I could even do something what's called a pressure point. When we put a pressure bandage on somebody or we bandage them up and we elevate, we're moving the bleeding area above the heart so that blood's not going to go uphill and it might slow the bleeding down. If he continues to bleed, I can come in here to a major vessel called his brachial artery. We have two brachial arteries that run on the inside of our arms. This is called our brachial muscle. Inside is called the humerus. So the brachial artery sits right below the bicep. By taking your fingers and pressing in below the bicep, we're actually pushing this vessel, the brachial artery, against the bone, the humerus. And this is the major blood supply to his hands. So if I can't control bleeding with pressure and elevation, I can come in here, take my fingers, 
press in underneath his bicep, push in until I get bleeding controlled. When I collect this finger here, I need to transport that with Patrick but we gotta keep this finger alive. So what we do with any piece of meat is we keep it cold, and that's what this finger is, is a piece of meat. So in order to keep this finger cold, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a plain paper towel, a, a rag, whatever you have laying around, as long as it's nice and clean, and I'm going to take this finger and I'm gonna wrap it up in this rag. The reason I'm doing that is because I'm gonna put this against something very cold, like an ice pack. So I've got an ice pack here. The reason you want to wrap this in a towel or a, uh, a cloth before you put it on the ice pack is, is that the ice pack is going to preserve the finger, but if you lay the finger directly against the ice pack, it could get frostbite and actually damage the skin before we get to the hospital. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this ice pack around this finger to keep it as cold as possible. I'm going to take the ice pack and the finger and put it in something plastic. So I've got this Ziploc bag here. I'm going to place this in here and zip this up. And if we've called 911 for Patrick, we're definitely going to give this to the emergency medical personnel so that they can take this with them and Patrick will get this reattached at the hospital. We hope this video has given you some good information on how to provide care for those that are sick and injured and given you confidence should you have to perform one of these acts. If you have any questions in regards to any video made by American Safety, please contact us on our website at www.americansafety.com. Thanks for joining us.